In this episode of the Church Security Roll Call, we're going to be discussing the shooting at the Greater Oak Missionary Baptist Church. Stay tuned. Hi, this is Chris with Sheepdog Church Security, and this is your Church Security Roll Call. Today we're going to be discussing the article, 2001 Greater Oak Missionary Baptist Church Shooting. If you'd like to read that article, go to our website, sheepdogchurchsecurity.net, and look under the News tab. So let us begin in the Bible. Today's verse is uh, Proverbs 27, verse 23, and it reads like this, Know well the condition of your flocks, and give attention to your herds. So we're going to be discussing this shooting incident at, at uh, the Greater Oak Missionary Baptist Church. Um, but before I get there, I have a couple disclaimers. The first one is this, is we never, I, I never want you to think that we're going to be talking down about the victims. It's, it's not about that at all. You know, it's easy to be Monday morning quarterback. That's not necessarily what this is. What we're trying to do is we're trying to honor them by looking at this, you know, this tragedy and trying to figure out what we can do as other churches, fellow Christians, to prevent this from happening to us. So that's one disclaimer. The next one is this, is my researcher that I use for these articles, she does a very good job on finding in as many resources as possible. But with that said, there could be some errors and some omissions in this material. Our intent here is to talk about the situation, the generally what occurred, and then try to pull out of it what we can learn and what things we can apply, hopefully sooner than later, with our safety teams and our congregations. So before I continue, one of our best downloads that we have to offer is actually the, um, we call it the safety member training record. And it's a, uh, it's a, a nice little spreadsheet. So it works on Microsoft Excel or Google Docs or Google, I'm sorry, Google Spreadsheet is what they call it. And it's a nice way just to keep everyone's training records in one, in one file, if you will. And so I want to encourage you to get that. It also allows you, if you're more of the pen and paper, it's actually made so you can print. And so you could print off me, you know, a bunch of copies of it and, make, and then simply fill it out. So make sure you check that out. It's a really good download. It's really been super popular. All right. So let's get into what happened. I'm going to be doing a little bit of reading here only because I want to make sure that I get this very clear and I get the details. Um, that my researcher worked hard to find. So this is what happened. It was it was May 18th, 2001. It was a Friday evening revival service at the Greater Oak Missionary Baptist Church. Um, as the service neared its conclusion, the pastor issued an altar call and a nervous man, nervous looking man walked in. A witness saw a gun as he walked by. He went to where his wife was. So this is the bad guy. He went to where his wife was and their child um, who was sitting in a front pew, and he sat down next to her. When he whispered in her ear, she moved away, pulled out her phone, and tried to make a call. He moved closer, and she kept scooting away, begging him not to kill her. The man grabbed his son, lifted his gun, and shot and killed his wife. After that, the man, um, after that, the man stood up, still holding on to the kid, and another woman in the congregation um, stepped in and tried to take the boy away from him, so he shot her too. Still holding his son, he tried to shoot himself, but the gun jammed. He later told the judge that it was intent, his intent to kill himself. So he leaves the church and drives away, but it wasn't long before the police chief caught up to him, and after a short standoff, he surrendered on the condition that his son would ride with him to the police station. So what we have here is, is really your domestic violence spillover. It's a really a good example of what happens in churches all over, not necessarily the shooting, but when there's a, a relationship where violence has entered into it, and sometimes for many, many years, that can play itself out in churches. And so we have to be very aware of this. So here's the kind of the background for these two. And if you've had to deal with domestic violence in the past, or you know you know somebody or whatever, 
this is gonna this is really gonna scream out at you is like this is so usual if if if, if you will normal um, so before the shooting just two months prior to the shooting she had moved out of the house. And she had actually filed for a domestic violence restraining order. Um, she had planned to divorce him and even move to another state taking their son. So you see all the risk here, right? At the end of a domestic violence relationship, what you often see is the abuser becomes extremely violent, extremely aggressive, and it just gets worse and worse and worse, and we never know where it's going to go. And we're going to come back to that here in a minute. But he had made several threats that she had reported to her friend who she was living with, and she had also reported several times to the police. Well, on the Thursday night before, he called and he threatened her again. Um, this time she told her friend, but she didn't call the police. Um, and then, so here we are. The stage is set. You have a relationship falling apart, highly violent, you know, lots of domestic abuse in there. And now we have these verbal threats that are coming out against her. Um, as far as the killer is concerned, um, he was a former minister. He was a convicted felon. Um, the gun that he used for the killing was stolen. Um, and another note of importance to us is this is he was the only one with a gun in church that day so what are our lessons learned about this as you can tell already my big push is towards that domestic violence spillover that's kind of be the focus of this lessons learned we have to have open communication about people in our congregation that are going through something like this for one i mean if 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 they're living in a, in a violent relationship, you know, we as the church, of course, want to help them. And so we need to make sure that when you're hearing this or you, people are learning about this, that they're communicating it, you know, either telling the pastor or telling some elder or somebody that can kind of help that victim through what they're going through, especially if it's coming to an end and it's at the point of separation and divorce and child custody and all that kind of stuff. We have to know as a team that this is a highly risky situation. And so we need to be at a heightened level of security, if you will. You know, a high, higher level of sa like safety posture. And so here are some things that I would say you have to plan in order to, you know, kind of put this together. And it's basically eight steps. So the first one is open communication. We have to know about that. The pastor needs to let the team know that, hey, we are at a heightened level of security. And if, if there's worry about the pastor sharing something, you know, outside of that, you know, confidentiality thing, just at least let the team know, hey, something's going on that you should be aware of, or we need to be at a heightened level. And they don't have to necessarily give details, um, but if they're given permission, then all by, by all means, get those details. One of those things of heightened security could simply be keeping the exterior doors locked and monitored. And the idea there is this, is when people are coming and going, you know, you can have greeters or even a safety team member letting people in, shaking people's hands. That's great. But the door is in a locked position, so all you have to do is get out of the way and or pull the door shut, and it's locked. In a situation like this, maybe if they were watching the outside of the building, watching the parking lot, and they saw an aggressive, angry-looking person coming towards the door, there's an opportunity there to shut the door and call police. Other information that you're going to want, if you're allowed to have it, is simply this. You know, what's the subject's physical description? What do they look like? Do we have a picture of them? Do they have a Facebook page? And we can look at several pictures of them. You know, what kind of automobile do they drive? What's the license plate? And it's kind of that same idea. Now you have more information to watch that parking lot. And if you see that person show up, you know it's them. So shut the door. You go into that lockout type posture. The other thing that you can do is this, is a lot of states, a lot of jurisdictions allow you to do what's called a trespass warning. And so if there's somebody at your church that's at risk of somebody out there, get that trespass warning. It kind of serves as the same way as a restraining order. And the idea is simply this. Once again, it's informing the police of what's going on. 
They've gone through the process of issuing a no trespass warning to them. Then if you have to call, they show up and you call them, they're breaking the law right then and there. They don't have to shoot anybody. They don't have to do anything else. They're breaking the law as soon as they show up on the property. Also, too, you know, depending on how many cops work in your jurisdiction, I think about my last jurisdiction, Belle Plaine, um, you know, there's, we're probably, we're at about nine full-time officers. I don't know what's going on in those other shifts and what they're experiencing, but when I get a call, I can go look at a history and that kind of stuff comes up. So that's another reason for that trespass warning. So they can read, hey, Mrs. Smith is being threatened by Mr. Smith and she goes to the church there and the church is concerned about violence because of past threats and all that good stuff. So it puts it all together in the police officer's mind. So get that restraining order to protect the church or that no trespass warning. Um, the next thing is part of this process. So, you know, you got your guys, they know what's going on. They have a good vehicle description. Maybe there's a no trespass order in place. They're at a heightened posture of locked doors. They're watching the parking lot. They see him coming or they see the subject coming up. It could be a her. I just use men all the time. I don't, sorry for that. But um, it, and then you call police immediately and get them in, in route. The next thing I would recommend that you do at minimum is barricade the intended victim. If the aggressor is focused on one person in particular, in this case, his wife, get her out of the sanctuary, hide her into a room, barricade her in that room along with her kid in order to protect them. It's kind of the same thing with executive protection. So if you're at your church serving to protect your pastor and there's a protest or something breaks out in that sanctuary, in that congregation, and and it looks like it's getting out of hand and the pastor's the focus of all that attention, get them out of there. Bring them back to the office. Lock them down in the office. Barricade them in there. And now it kind of takes away that tension, some of that tension. Now, if they're planning active shooter, you know, if he was planning on shooting more than just her, then that's not necessarily going to do anything, which kind of brings up the next thing. As all of this is going down, he's walking up to the locked doors. The police are called. You could also go into a soft lockdown. And we've talked about this in our training before. Is, you know, the classes can continue running, the Sunday school and, you know, the nursery and all that stuff. They can continue to operate the way they are, but they just shut their doors. They make sure that they're in a lockdown, you know, a partial lockdown, a soft lockdown. So that way, if things do escalate, it, we're not still running to shut doors. They're shut, they're locked. The other thing is, is finally, of course, maybe going into a full lockdown. And that's probably gonna be because you've seen a gun, you've detected, you know, violence, you know, maybe he's throwing a brick at the, at the window or something like that. You know, now you need to go into a full lockdown. So just once again, for our lessons learned, open communication about domestic violence. We have to have it. The team needs to know what's going on, even if it's just a teeny bit. If we can get everything we want, we want a heightened lock, uh, you know, a heightened safety posture with the exterior doors locked. We want to know the subject's physical description, their vehicle description. We want to have the local law enforcement issue a no trespass warning. So that way, if that person shows up, they're breaking the law right off the bat. Plus, we're informing police. We call 911 immediately upon seeing them to, you know, to take care of that situation for us, hopefully. The next thing is barricading the intended victim, going into a soft lockdown, and maybe even going into a full lockdown. So before I let you go, I do want you to know a lot of this training is in our active shooter response course that you can take online or you can get the instructor material and teach it to your team. And all of that is part of, or at least the online individual training is part of our safety member certification course, which is seven different modules that cover everything from active shooter, use of force, verbal de-escalation, child protection, fire, severe weather, all that good stuff. So please check that out. Finally, if you like this video, I'm gonna ask you, could you please subscribe? Um, it's just a way you're gonna get notified every time a new one comes out, and uh, we just appreciate that. Um, also, if you look in the description, you're gonna see that there's a number of different links. Um, you know, it can be free downloads, 
um, all kinds of stuff to our website, stuff that might interest you. So thank you so much for joining us this week. And hey, let's be careful out there. This program is made for informational purposes only and should not be taken as legal advice.